And it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so we're so excited to talk to you. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to ask you uh, was, could you maybe tell us a little bit about your musical and compositional journey? Sure. Um, and for me to do that, I think I, I need to start at the very beginning and try and briefly just cover a couple things. I was born in 1955. So musically in the world at that time, that was sort of the, the tail end of the dawn of the beginning of rock and roll. If you count, let's say 1951's Rocket 88 by Ike Turner and Jackie Brenston as the beginning of rock and roll. So I was born in 1955. And by the time of 1962, 63, I was seven or eight years old. And I, at that time, I think a young human being has a brain that starts to function in a way that you can sort of grasp your own thoughts and hold them as yours and decide, I like that, I don't like that. And you can even start to suss out why or why not. So at that time, uh, there wasn't a lot of music in the house. I'm not even sure there was a stereo system at the time, but we had radios and in Milwaukee, where I was born, there was a WOKY radio and WRIT radio. These were AM stations. So I would be listening to these as a seven and eight year old. And then at that time it was the early rock and roll was playing and uh, the folk music uh, of the time was playing, whether it was uh, Peter, Paul and Mary or the Kingston Trio or Joan Baez and then Bob Dylan. So I was getting a great mix of, of that kind of music. And, and then also on the radio, there would be popular um, movie tunes of the day and all kinds of stuff. So I got this early on a great mishmash of music starting to go into my brain. Uh, and this was great. And it's probably pretty typical of most young people. But then in 1964 on February 9th, the British invasion landed in America in the form of the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. And I'm sure this story is told by millions of other young musicians at the time or now old fart musicians like me who, who saw that happen and were completely transfixed and mesmerized. And I just was thinking, oh, wow, music. That's music as a, a thing you can do as a human being. You can play it. You can cause all this excitement. You can do this. So I, along with countless millions of other young Americans, started to form thoughts of being in a band. And, and uh, I was nine at the time. And then by the time I was 12 or 13, I had pestered my parents into uh, getting a, uh, an organ. I wanted to play organ in the band. Uh, so I got a Farfisa, Farfisa Combo Compact uh, organ and a Gretsch Chet Atkins amplifier with two 12-inch speakers in it. So I was like, oh, this is great. What I really wanted was a Hammond B3 and a Leslie speaker, but that was way beyond the ken of my parents at the time. So I then formed a, a rock band with five friends or four friends uh, in 1968. And we didn't know what we were doing. I didn't know what I was doing really. And, but that was the beauty of that time period. You were so excited about music and making music uh, yourself. Um, and before this, I had taken the, the uh, perfunctory piano lessons that all young people were taking at the time, and I hated it. Uh, I lasted about six months. So I didn't really get excited about music on the piano at that time. But, but after the, the Beatles thing happened, and after in that interim between uh, 64 and 68, I was finding myself sitting at the family piano plunking away on my own, uh, improvising and teaching, starting to teach myself, which ended up being what happened. I'm a, I'm a self-taught piano player. So this is going somewhere, trust me. <laughs> so so I, I then uh, was in a rock and roll bands from 1968 to, to 72. Um, but in the middle of that time period, I was playing French horn in my high school uh, band and playing so playing some classical music. So I started to get interested in that as well. And so I, I sought out the recordings by uh, pieces by Beethoven and Brahms and Tchaikovsky and more modernist Stravinsky at the time and, and got blown away by that stuff too. So again, all the sounds, all this music pouring into my, my young person. 
And I, at this time, I had no, no thoughts of composing at all. I didn't even think about that. I was just having fun and making music with my rock and roll buddies. Uh, and then the thing happened in 1970. I was 15 years old. Um, and we were in an English class uh, with Mary Johnson, who was my English teacher at the time. We were reading John Steinbeck's book, The Pearl, uh, a novella, a short novella. And in it, there are some various themes of humanity and family and such. And Mary Johnson said one day, let's, let's analyze this book from a different perspective. Let's, let's have some of you write musical themes based on some of the human themes in the novella. I was, I don't think I was paying attention to her and she was going around the class talking to various people who I thought perhaps were good suspects for this, this, uh, this plan. And, and she came to my desk and she looked at me and she said, and Jerome, I would like you to, to participate in this too. And I, I remember I it just was spontaneous. I was kind of a wise ass. I said, what are you talking about? I don't write music. And she looked at me and she said, well, why don't you just, you know, give it a try. So I think being the, the cocky young person I was at the time, I said, okay, what, what is composing but making up stuff and sound and organizing it? That was kind of still my feeling about composing at this late date. So this is in 1970, 52 years ago. And I, I went off and, and I created three little themes on piano, very simple harmonies. Um, and, and recorded them on a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine and my parents' uh, Wurlitzer spinet piano and brought them into the class and played the tape and, and got a very positive reaction. And that was the beginning of my life as a composer. Uh, so that, that's kind of how I then got into creating music and deciding that I wanted to be a composer of music for scored music, notated music. And I got more and more into um, the classical world. I, I stopped the rock and roll band stuff in 1972 and, and just started to, I exploded as a composer, not knowing anything about what I was doing. The blissful ignorance was wonderful. And I just started writing pieces. So by 1972, I had written the chamber orchestra piece and I'm writing pieces for woodwind quintet and trombone, not knowing what I was doing, but it was great. I was, I found my life's calling and it's because of, I may have gotten there without Mary Johnson, my English teacher, but uh, she really pointed me towards something I didn't know I could even look at going toward. So that's my early, that's my, how I became a musician and a composer. That's an amazing story. Wow. So if, yeah, because I read The Pearl as well. I remember that book. Um, so <laughs> that's such a, that, that's a really, that's a really good assignment. And it just brought you here. That's incredible. The, the, that's the incredible. very first tune I wrote is called Song of the Family. And it's right out of the notions of family in, yeah. in, in that novella. And uh, I play it to this day, whenever I'm oh around gosh. the piano. I play uh, the other little pieces too, uh, as a way to keep me connected uh, to my, my beginnings. Um, I've right. even used that melodic material over the decades from some of those pieces in my more complex chamber and orchestral pieces. No one I, knows that, but I know it. <laughs> now they do. Oh no, but that's amazing. <laughs> that's so, that's so, that's, it's so nice to hear something like that. Like that, you know, it's one thing from, you know, from an English class brought you into the world of music and that's, and, and I'll say one more thing about that. Mary mm -hmm. Johnson and I remained friends until she died three years ago at the age of 85. Wow. So we, we were close. I visited her. I talked to her on the phone. Um, she was really important to me. So I guess actually that kind of leads me to the next question. So you are, um, well, you have been, you have been associated with Tribeca New Music for many years, or and you've well, played actually, with since since yeah. 2015 is the yeah. first. But they did uh, two great concerts for my 60th birthday in 2015. Oh, I had gone to their concerts before and knew about them and always liked what they did. But my mm -hmm. my actual involvement as a composer was 2015. Right, and so 
you, you are close with our um with our artistic director Preston Staley and uh, another he... another organ player he played Hammond <laughs> yeah. D3 and Leslie and he's a couple years maybe older than I but he played uh, in some bands uh, in the late 60s and he toured with anyway yes I right right I right friend. yeah so he he actually describes you um as an old school composer or how uh -huh. I would, I, I quite like the, the description of an analog artist, right? So um, could you maybe just talk to us about why you have made the decision to kind of stick with this pen and paper technique and not, and not go over to the side of any sort of computer, um, computer music or electronic music in, in sure. that sense? About uh, eight or nine or 10 years ago, Frank O'Terry at, um, it's now New Music USA, he does the New Music Box. Uh, he wanted to write an article for the publication uh, about composers and the software and the systems that they use to create their scores. But he wanted to include someone like me because I didn't use any of that stuff. And he, so it was interesting. I, I've had to answer this question many times and uh, that was one of the first times I had to do it in such a formal fashion. But it's there's a couple of reasons. I we're sitting at a computer right now, and I, frankly, I don't like sitting at a computer for a long period of time. It I know some people have this problem. It, I start to feel a little weird, not quite ill, but not great if I'm at a computer a long time. So if you if you are doing scores with a computer, you're you have to and. So that would be one of the reasons, but the most important reason is that I just love the tactile quality of taking my tools in the early days, my ink pens, and then uh, later uh, mechanical pencils and taking from blank paper and, and starting from blank paper. And by the end of many hours, you have a score, full page of score of music. Uh, and and it's just the sound of the pen pencil on the paper. I love it. Uh, so it's um, and it also the way I think musically and the way I compose. I do a lot of this thinking in construction in my brain before I actually write anything down. So by I found that by doing uh, the scores on paper like that, it's very slow process. It's great for editorial work and making sure that what I am putting on the page is exactly what I'm hearing and what I want. So I know with computers, you can make all the kinds of mistakes you want because you can go back and, and easily fix things. In a score of mine, I um, if I'm on page 10 of the score and I decide that somewhere around page six, I really want another two measures in, you can't do it. You'd have to wipe everything out. So I really have to know what I'm doing. There's actually a great little film that um, NYU made. Uh, NYU is at the Fales collection at, at Bob's library and the downtown collection are, are archiving, archiving my life's work. They began that a few years ago and they'll do it till I croak. But they, they, uh, want, they wanted to do a, a, a little film that depicted some aspect of my life as a composer. And they chose the very topic that you brought up in terms of doing scores by hand. And they made a 20 minute little film, which you would think, well, that's not going to be very scintillating or interesting. <laughs> but they did a really good job of capturing uh, what, what I do on paper and my describing it. Even there's a four or five minute section where there's no talking. It's just the sound, the sound quality and the microphones are very good. There's a the sound of the pencil as I was drawing my staff lines. Anyway, so there's, there's a film out there if anyone wanted to see that and that explains, answers this question very well. So it's, it's also a visual art form to me. Uh, George Crumb started that uh, in a big way in my mind back in 1969, 70. But even before George Crumb, if you do a little research, there were people doing graphic scores and the shapes of hearts and things, you know, a couple hundred years ago or more. Uh, and I always thought that was very beautiful and interesting. You can tell a story, you can completely control it. It can be exactly yours. It doesn't come from a software system. I have nothing against that stuff, but it's just, like I said, it isn't for me. Uh, so it, it becomes artwork. And, and I took it to a point where I, I had 10 or 20 pages of one score of mine, 
this is about 30 years ago, hung in 101 Wooster Gallery on Wooster Street. They had an exhibition where they put up pages of a person's score as artwork framed. And then they, this is before cassettes, I'm sorry, before CD players. So they had little cassette machines in a basket on the wall and a, a, a patron at the museum could put a headset on and listen to what they were looking at. So it, yeah, I, I love it. I mean, it's, I, I guess I'm gonna keep doing it that way. Although I'll say I've developed, I'm older now, I'm, you know, I'm 67. So I've got arthritis in my neck. My lower the lumbar spine is all screwed up. Part of it, the neck, the, the cervical spine issues are from uh, working incorrectly, sitting with my leg crossed, my work table really low and hanging my big fat 10 pound head for 40 years uh, you know, over doing this kind of work. So I got smart and I worked with an Alexander uh, technique person to help me um, correct the way I physically worked. And that's helped a lot. But I've, you know, I've done some damage from all this, but yeah, I'll plug away. I, I also want to verify that people understand that when I was first doing scores, I was using vellum. You know what vellum is? Onion skin. It's thin, thin, uh, translucent paper uh, with a kind of a surface that takes ink. So I was using that and, and ink, uh, yeah. lapidograph ink pens. Oh man, did you have to have patience to, to, to yeah. use that because you could you could make one mistake and scrape it off with a razor blade and then if you made another mistake in that spot you couldn't scrape it again and right. and and just to be completely complete with this line of questioning uh, I also used for a few years believe it or not maybe you don't know these existed but there was a music typewriter it was this big thing that looked like a typewriter and it, yeah. instead of letters, it had musical symbols for the keys and a little pointer that pointed on to, to where the paper was. And if you, what was supposed to happen, if you pressed a quarter note, that would go right where the pointer pointed. Mm. So I was doing parts for orchestral pieces on a music typewriter. Just imagine oh that, you know, thousands and thousands of notes and it's dink, okay, dink. <laughs> so. I, I honestly like that. Oh my gosh. See, but it makes you, I think that it kind of forces you to just be more mindful of what you're doing then because- Exactly. Yeah. yeah, in this day and age, it's just immediate gratification. You know, I sound like a grandma, but like, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, I have such respect for um, for how it was done um, because yeah, yeah, it was more, I think it was more tangible, as I said, more mindful. Mindfulness, exactly. I, I tried to allude to that before when I said that it really forced me to make sure what I was putting on that page was exactly what I want because I could not go back and correct right. it. Right. I mean, it's that's just, incredible. yeah. That's so, that's so fun. I, that's so, um, yeah, inspiring. I think that, I think more people should, should maybe have that approach. <laughs> To well, all I, they I, do. You know, like I said, I don't have anything <laughs> against the, the the scores look great when they're done on the on the you know what do you call them the computers and yeah and all that. But it's uh, you know it's not my. Yeah. In fact, I get people saying to me, "What what what uh, software do you use?" <laughs> <laughs> You're like my hands. <laughs> yeah, I use my, my muscle in my right arm. That's my software. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, actually, so. So I guess the next the next thing I kind of want to wanted to talk about was we talked about how you started composing. We talked about what you use, and now maybe could you go? Could you walk us through your compositional um, process? Because you write for such a wide variety of instruments and instrumentations. What is it like, like to to sit down and write for something that is perhaps unconventional? to Western uh, ears per se. Uh, sure. Um, well, whether I'm writing a, a piece for solo toy piano or like my piece, The Animus Child or a huge orchestral choral work that's 90 minutes long for 250 musicians, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the process is exactly the same. Um, I, I, I've used a lot of language in my many, many of my pieces, probably over half of the works I do uh, use text poems, prose, um, but even the pieces that do not use text, I consider them to still be stories. 
So the first thing I do, of course, I decide what piece I'm writing, or maybe I have a commission. And then I decide, well, what do I feel about it based on the whoever the commissioner is? I, I, I let these things sink in. So it's, this is way before any considerations about tones or pitches or harmonies or rhythms or any of that stuff. What is it making me feel? Uh, if there's language involved, a poem, for instance, uh, you know, I, I will sit with that poem for a long time, memorize it, speak it out loud, walk around my house performing it out loud, outside in the park performing it out loud. Um, people must think I'm crazy, but probably not. Uh, so until it, it just is so ingrained in me, and I, and then at some point when time is right, I'll say, okay, let's flip a little switch and see what I'm hearing. Uh, in my mind regarding music for, for this text I've chosen. So this can go on for a couple of months or more. Um, so then uh, I will start to listen. And then uh, I'll, oh, I messed up. There's one step before I flip the switch. I, I, I'm a for, people, believe it or not, I'm, I'm kind of a formalist. So. Uh, formal structures, the arc of a thing, the arc of the, the sound in space from here to here uh, is important to me. How is it going to sit vibrating in the air? I'm, I'm just curious how that will uh, feel to the listener. And, and, I, and so I, I consider a formal structure first, and then I flip that switch. Um, and then I start to listen for music in my head and, and hopefully something will come. And so far after all these decades, it still comes, <laughs> but you never know. Uh, and then I, I start to, I don't sketch at all. I, I go right to the form, the final uh, uh, score. That's where that really careful thinking comes, comes through. So, uh, and earlier in my career, and, and still to a large degree, I'm a, an inner ear composer, so I hear, uh, and then I write what I'm hearing in my head. I have noticed, however, and this is an aging process thing, that the, the, the volume and clarity of that inner ear is getting a little fuzzy now and then. <laughs> so, that, that's where you can be really benefited by being able to, you know, play a keyboard a little bit, so you... You can you can go that route, um, but for most of my compositional career, I, I, I write from the inner ear. So that's and that's how it is. Whether it's a toy piano piece uh, that's six minutes long or a ninety-minute orchestral choral piece, it's it's from beginning to end, carefully hearing it as I go and shaping the formal structure. And when you use language, that really can aid you greatly, and especially with me because I know you can deconstruct texts so they're not even recognizable in the final piece. But I don't, it's not my thing. If I'm using a text, I want the language to be heard really clearly. So if you're using a four or five part, for instance, uh, the piece that's of mine that's getting premiered in a week in Pennsylvania, it's called I Am Waiting. And that's the name of a Lawrence Ferlinghetti poem. And the piece is for actor, singer, Lisa Carr and the wonderful Naked Eye Ensemble in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And that's an eight piece ensemble. So there's one poem of his called Pity the Nation that is sung at the beginning of the piece. And then I use I Am Waiting, which is a seven section poem. So when you, when you have a seven section poem and you think about language and music as I do, that kind of sets up your formal structure kind of for you. I, I, really, love, I really love hearing about uh, hearing about that. And I'm sure that the other composers um, who are watching this uh, are also quite interested in, in that as well. Um, actually, you, so you mentioned the, um, your upcoming work. Could you maybe talk to us a little bit about that? We are, we're quite oh, interested sure. in hearing about it. It's kind of funny because the piece is called I Am Waiting, which is these days that's become sort of a humorous title since it was completed two years ago. It was supposed to premiere in May of 2020, and of course the pandemic descended upon us. So we've all been waiting and waiting and waiting, and, and now here we are about to finally do the piece. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a work for, I wrote for Lisa Carr, who's a, a dear uh, friend of mine. She's a great uh, actor, singer, interdisciplinary artist, very intuitive, very volcanically uh, theatrical, and uh, and the Naked Eye Ensemble, uh, Zhu Ping Song's uh, Naked Eye Ensemble out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. 
Zhu Ping and the ensemble commissioned the work in 2019. And then I went about my process. I, I decided I wanted to use two Lawrence Ferlinghetti poems and I wanted the piece to be done so it could be premiered before the 2020 election because it's sort of a pointed commentary on uh, what our 45th president, the former guy was doing. And so it was an, uh, it wanted, I wanted it to be out in the world before the election because I know I would be influencing so many voters. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Anyway, so it, it got postponed and canceled. At first it was postponed and it felt like a cancellation, but now I'm so happy that we're getting back, back to it. Uh, and it's, it's a, a very physical work, um, very demanding. Uh, Zhu Ping and her group are great and Lisa is great. We had our first rehearsals last weekend just with the ensemble without Lisa and she zoomed in to one of those just to listen and uh, it's just uh, it was it was very emotional for me I, I didn't know how I was going to feel after two years of not doing anything and uh, it was quite emotional and I'm very excited about it but it's now still relevant. Uh, it's subject matter is still relevant. It's a uh, leans hard against everything that Trump has left in his wake um, and the things that are still going on. Um, so it's, uh, I'm excited about that. It, it talking about this is brings up another aspect of a great deal of my work. There's a, a huge percentage of it is topical or political. Um, always topical, whether I was writing piece by, with a text by Herman Hess when I was really young that was about my own love life, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or, or then uh, in the uh, 80s when I started to write more topical materials and then really zooming into that in the 90s and to this day. Um, a lot of the, the stories I like to tell are, some of them are still very personal, like Sunflower Sutra, which is about the, the fact that my sister was dying at the time of cancer. And so I wrote the piece for her using that Ellen Ginsberg poem, uh, that speaking pianist work. Uh, so there are personal pieces and personal stories, but many of them are what I about what I feel it means to be an American when I was first writing in the 20th century and now in the 21st century. So I'm very interested in current events and, and also very interested in history and and how history is perceived and i create a lot of works out of out of that you, you are known um for in like a number of pieces uh you've written things that illuminate some of the historical interactions between indigenous native nature nations and white europeans how did you first what piqued your interest in this uh compositional topic um Great question and and very true. I think I have 10, maybe a dozen, 10 or a dozen pieces that are uh, about that topic. Um, back 40 years ago, uh, I was working on a piece called In the Throat of River Mornings, the seven uh, song, seven piece song cycle or seven song song cycle with text by a, a good friend, the, the now late poet James Hazard. And they're all about Midwestern places. And one of the one of the poems was called Black Hawk Surrender Ground. In fact, the four framed pages of that very song are on the wall to my left. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was part of that exhibit I mentioned at the Wooster Gallery. Uh, anyway, so that that poem touched on um, various things in a, a very powerful way. And one of them was about bison and the decimation of the bison, which just at, I think at the time, I, I mean, I had, at a time I was like many Americans, I was, I was not that young, I was 33. No, I'm sorry, I was 27. Uh, and, and I had not given that much thought to that aspect of our history, in part because we weren't really taught it very well in grade school uh, and high school. And the things we were told were all this really nonsensical sort of written by the white person history sort of glossing over of things. And so I, I got to thinking after doing that, that song with Jim Hazard, I should do a little bit of looking into this. I'm an American and America, I knew I was smart enough to know at that time that America was built on the blood and bones of native nations, African-Americans through slavery, uh, eventually Asian-Americans in a different sort of way. Um, Hispanic Americans in a different sort of way. 
So I, I got, I, I narrowed it down and I thought, well, let me look into the indigenous nation aspect of this. And of course, Wisconsin, where I'm from, has 11 or 12 Indian reservations in it. So that was a big deal. And then I recalled when I was younger, the Milwaukee Museum always just depicted, depicted uh, the dioramas of native life as, as if these people were, well, gone and extinct. And I thought, well, that's not true. It can't be true. I, I'm currently working on a piece that's a commission from the New York State Council on the Arts with a group Thing New York. Do you know Thing New York? They're a, a sextet with Gelsey Bell, Paul Pinto, Aaron Rodgers, Andrew Livingston, David Ruder, and Jeffrey Young. And they're theatrical as all get out. They're actors, right. they're, they're players, they're crazy. But they commissioned me to do a piece and, and I'm doing a piece that steps once again into this area and I'm doing the research phase now. It's a, an illumination of the treaty period and all of the 378 to 500 plus treaties and agreements that were made between uh, 1778 and let's say uh, 1781, 16, uh, sorry, 1881, 1871, ah, sorry, 1871. Uh, and, and even some of the earlier agreements before the actual treaty period, just to highlight that they exist they are, uh, everyone was um, violated or broken in some fashion. I should say not everyone, most of them were, a great, great majority of them were. The fact that they exist and they, for the most part, are still the law of the land. Um, and I just, I think that's part of this thing that I, I'm interested in being a better American by looking into these things and knowing that these documents still exist. Uh, so I'm, that's the piece I'm doing. It's not going to be any commentary from Native Americans, from white people. The language entirely will be derived from the treaties themselves. I'm using all, all 378 of them. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about how I'm doing that yet because I'm still working it out. Okay. But it's, it's just going to be, hey, America, do you know that these, these things happened? These documents still exist. Right. Go check it out. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to take a side, although I have a very obvious bias if you talk to me. So, so anyway, that's how well, all that I'm, happened. I'm excited to hear that piece as well. Um, and actually, just before we go, uh, I have two more questions for you. Uh, one is sort of, um, it's, I, I want it, it has to do with your latest album, The Redness of Blood. Um, yeah, let's maybe start with that one. There it is. Hey, um, could you maybe just talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, just because we, we, Tribeca New Music shared it, uh, in December yeah. when it came yeah. out and, um, we've been, I've been, I've been listening to it and it's, it's really powerful and I would really love to know more about, more about it. Um, Ab absolutely. Walk us through um, that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something I'm very proud of. And it's the one thing musically I was able to do during the pandemic, um, <clears throat> I've always been very fond of and admiring of New World Records. They're this reputable, venerable, old uh, recording uh, company that does contemporary music. And uh, I looked online and said, well, how do you, you know, I did a, a, a submission, followed their guidelines, sent it off. I think it was in March of maybe 2020, 2021. I, I can't remember. And I thought, okay, now that's going to get on some application pile that I'll, I'll hear from them in two years. Uh, they wrote me back in a month and said they wanted to do the record and blah, blah, blah. So we went, started going through the process. Now, all the pieces were recorded already. They were already in the can. I'd uh, done um, two of them uh, in 2015 after my 60th Tribeca New Music Concerts. And then two of them were done even before that by Sarah Cahill and, and, and Lisa Moore. And so these things were in the can waiting for the right moment. So anyway, it's got four pieces uh, from 19, as old as 1994 to um, 2015. It starts with Bringing Roses With Her Words, which is a commission from the great Australian American pianist, Lisa Moore, where she's, she, there's no language, but there's a lot of vocalizing. And it's a, it's a piece that's meant to be a, a memorial for my very first love, Robin Bloom, who died in 2009. I, I fell in love with her when I was 15. That's when I started writing music too. 
But anyway, I wanted to do a, a, a memorial piece for her. And that's what that work is. And it involves Lisa moving on stage and off stage and all kinds of interesting things. And she, she does a fantastic job. The next work is related to something we were talking about. It's called For Pate to Kahunska. And Pate to Kahunska is the Lakota name of Charlotte Black Elk. It means um, uh, white buffalo woman of different motion. That's her Lakota name. So I wanted to, after all these decades of friendship and all the generosity from her spirit from her, I wanted to create an honor piece for her. So that's what the work is. And it's for uh, uh, flute, uh, bass, clarinet, cello, uh, bassoon, Hammond organ, yay, and uh, one percussion. Uh, and it, I'll, I'll tell you a little funny aside, the work starts with that anecdote I mentioned, the telephone thing where she yelled at me. So the piece starts with the ensemble going, <laughs> kind of mimicking a, a phone ringing. So they do that four times, and then there's a little silence, and the whole group goes, what? <laughs> and then it launches into this, this phrase that look, Charlotte keeps repeating when we talk about some of these issues. She said, after all this, we are still here. We are still here. So it's an honor piece that goes through 14 minutes of, of, of instrumental music for her. Um, then the third piece is called There is a Field, and it was commissioned by the great Berkeley uh, pianist Sarah Cahill uh, for her wonderful project called A Sweeter Music, which is a um, Martin Luther King Jr. quote. Uh, and she commissioned 15, 16, 20 composers to write anti-war or peace-related works. This was in 2008. So I wrote a piece using uh, Walt Whitman text and Rumi text, Walt Whitman uh, um, poems from the drum taps section of Leaves of Grass and a Rumi poem that's, uh, um, uh, uh, that's very uh, beautiful. And I found on a subway actually in a, a music in motion, one of those poetry in motion things on a subway. Uh, and Sarah does a fantastic job of, of articulating the text and singing and whistling and there, all kinds of vocalizing and percussion playing. And finally, the last work is The Redness of Blood, which is one of my earlier works that's about my blood family. Uh, it's an honor piece that's 26 minutes long for my grandmother, Regina, who was the only grandparent I ever knew. My other three were dead by the time I was born. Uh, my two parents and my three siblings and myself, so so seven people. So it's just it, there's uh, introduction material and there's there's uh, a mu uh, music for each of the family members. There's an elegy for my grandmother Regina who died in the middle of composing the piece. Uh, and then there at the end there's a, a march that they all march around the audience, and then they eventually leave the stage and and march off and finish the piece in the hallway which if there's a good hallway, it's really cool. <laughs> so it's, it was just a thrill to do this. And, and I think New World did a great job. Once again, there it is. So if you go to yeah. newworld. Oh, I don't even know what it is, org or com. <laughs> Well, we'll have all the we links work that out later. Don't worry, I'll have a link to everything. And, and we also linked it in our Instagram and Facebook. So it's it's around and I'm, and I really encourage people to go and listen to it. It's a very personal album for you. Uh, that's, yeah. that's amazing. It's so great. Um, yeah, we, and we love it. We love it at Tribeca. So thank you. Thank you. Do Who? 
what a career that you've had and you know it's it's been so nice to hear all about it well you know it's thank you uh, alex and i've been all over the world i've been to china and australia and, and europe and italy three times and all because of musical stuff because doing things i could never afford to do I think Preston wanted me to talk about how do I live, how I've been able to do live in New York as a composer on practically no money. <laughs> I, think he was, I think he was interested in, in for younger composers because there are ways to do things and be autonomous and create music without being uh, shackled to something else that saps your energy. You just have to sacrifice just about everything that Americans seem to want in their lives. <laughs> so, so. I mean, but honestly, at this point, <laughs> it's kind of worth. I mean, it's worth it if it if you get to live the life that you have led, and I, make the and make the art that you have created. Yeah, yeah. I, I I I people would say I I don't use the word because it's not how I feel that you know I've sacrificed some things for the autonomy I've had. Uh, my autonomy has been incredibly valued, but it it was it was important enough that it was easy to go without what a new dishwasher or a new this a new that. Uh, spending money on all the little American life things that you know add up and add up and, until you you do have to get a job so you can keep getting more stuff. So anyway, <laughs> it's uh yeah. and and he and there are other aspects of being a composer and a young composer and how do you break through and get your music played? It's that's it, all those are all great questions and maybe not for this interview, but I I had my own theory and my own way of doing that and worked for me. Um, but it didn't involve going to graduate school and it, it just was a, a, a very freewheeling and, and, and um, kind of process that uh, had to do with patient persistence, do a concert, do a concert. If you make any money, have any money, spend it on your concerts, just keep doing concerts. What happens if you're, you know, if you're doing something that people want to hear, word starts to move around. And for me, one of the things that happened when I was doing that, I got to New York in 1984. And I know I'm going on too long here, but I, I, I went got to New York in 1984, but I didn't, I didn't do anything with music on my own until 1991. I wanted to live in New York and just see the city and, and do stuff. And I composed and did this. And, and, and uh, I had saved a lot of money in Milwaukee, fourteen thousand dollars back then. That was a lot of money, so I didn't have to work for two years. But then, when I decided to do my music, that's what I did. I did concerts and concerts. I met players. I, I um, always paid my musicians, no matter if I didn't have any money. Always paid them. And then I started to. Then one day, uh, Kyle Gann. You know Kyle Gann. He's a great composer and wrote for the uh, Village Voice for decades as a critic, and now has a podcast. The great theor theoretician on music, uh, really brilliant. At the time, he was writing for the Village Voice in the early 90s, and he heard about me, and he came to a little concert I did at a place called Bob on the Lower East Side, which is a little hole in the wall. And I had people like Mike Lowenstern and Todd Reynolds and Theo Blackman, all these people now who are really big names in their, in their world. Uh, and he started to write about me. And when I uh, did the big version of the Pahasapa Give Back in 1994, he did a big Village Voice piece on it. So that only happened because I did concerts, did concerts. I didn't care if there were 10 people there, 50 people. The number of audience members started to grow and grow. And it's just a be true to yourself kind of thing. I know that sounds corny. No, but I mean, that's great advice. So I guess embrace the grind but know what the grind is and like <laughs> embrace the right grind i guess yeah, um yeah. and just keep going yeah i love yeah. that that no that is very that's very helpful for for those young composers um listening and I, watching and the, yeah. these days alex i don't know you're younger maybe would this even work out this way because so much is online and social media and people are trying to break through through what do you call it? Oh, what's that? Thing? YouTube, you know that kind yes. of thing, <laughs> stuff like that. So it, it's a, it's just a yeah, fascinating. It's, it's not the same now as it was before computers in in the early '90s and late '80s. So, but it is still relevant because, you know, whereas you were going and doing physical concerts, right? Now people are 
just kind of they've kind of just put that online do i love that sometimes but i you know there's nothing like a show so well you know yeah. in we we learned in the pandemic because i got so many invitations for things and i looked at some but so much of it was so bad in terms of quality of production and sound quality that's why when preston started doing his concerts and he told me later it's a huge amount of work but was it ever worth it because his the production and sound values of the tribeca new music online stuff was really pretty good oh it's amazing yeah it wasn't How it would, wasn't yeah there were so many things i was getting that it was scratchy and weird camera stuff it's like people just set up their phone in a living room and just started banging <laughs> on stuff it was, you know. yeah no it's preston does a very good job at um at creating a good a great show so yeah he does. um yeah no but i mean i'm just i'm so thrilled that i got to talk to you you have given us so much to think about you've given me a lot to think about you've inspired me to go and write a little bit um and to <laughs> go book a show so i'm gonna go do that and uh thank, so it, thank you do it today doing it today um so thank well, you of so, course so the other thing yeah. you may know um that you have to be able to handle is rejection oh yeah now, a lot of oh, people yes. have <laughs> trouble with that but i always thought well this obviously it's a part of this whole it's a part of life period but certainly in the arts yeah absolutely absolutely yeah it's the necessary evil but it teaches you a lot so i think that's that's good yeah. well, thank <laughs> so, you and, and, and thanks yeah. for letting me i i i, I kind of squeezed in that last bit really quickly about practical concerts and how do you be a composer and how did i do it at least no it's great um, it's, but i was doing a concert one a concert every three months for a while incredible and that takes a lot of work and yeah. um energy no, absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely but no thank you it's it's all really valuable information everything that we've talked about has been so valuable so thank you thank you for being here